right, so let's go over some history. The first keyboard instruments date back to before the 3rd century and are based around the pipe organ design. We won't be covering them because while they do share similarities in the way they are played, and one could definitely say that the arrangement of keys on the piano has its origins here, but in terms of piano action, the organ is more of a wind instrument and operates in a completely different way. Uh, the first stringed keyboard instruments would likely be the clavichords. They worked on a pretty simple concept. The key was a single lever with a piece of brass similar to a flathead screwdriver that when the key was pressed would hit the string and remain in contact with it, producing sound in much the same way you can hammer on on a guitar. Moving forward, we get to the hapsichords. The action this time around can be likened to playing a guitar with a pick. Essentially, when you pressed a key on a harpsichord, the back of the key was raised towards the string, which simultaneously raised a damper and forced a pick to pluck at the string as it went past. Lowering the key would then move the pick back across the string, though due to the design the pick could fold off to the side so as not to make much noise. Also, the damper would fall back on the string to quiet it. Uh, the next invention was the single escapement action, the first of the true pianos. Uh, the basic idea here is that instead of pressing a metal edge to the string and thus making a sound from the press itself, a rather quiet result, or plucking the string, which while louder imposes both a rather high minimum volume and not much range from the minimum to maximum volumes, the piano would hit the string with a felt hammer, which could be struck with a wide range of force to play both softly and loudly, hence the name of the instrument fortepiano, or loud and soft in Italian. And the issue that needed to be solved was to have a way for the hammer to be released after hitting the key, as unlike with a pick of a harpsichord, it couldn't move past the string to let it vibrate, and unlike the metal pin of the clavichord, leaving it in contact with the string would immediately dampen the note. So when the player presses the key, the hammer needed to rise up to hit the string before lowering back down to allow the string to keep vibrating. Uh, to solve this issue, an escapement mechanism was devised that would uh, separate the hammer motion from the key motion at the very end of the key press. In the Cristofori action here, this was done by having the push bar on the key lever flick off the second lever here, resetting only when the key was raised back up in order to allow the next note to be played. Already at this point, a back check mechanism was added to catch the hammer as it fell down in order to prevent it from bouncing and hitting the strings again. Now, the design was quite revolutionary, but left something to be desired. Due to needing to reset the escapement mechanism, it meant that quick repetitions of the same note could not be played as the musician had to wait for the key to rise back up and the resetting process to complete. And so we finally come to the last change of the piano action that takes us to the modern piano. The double escapement action. In this design you have the key lever, the hammer lever, and finally the whippin assembly that is at the heart of the design. As you can see, compared to the previous design, it is much more complicated with many moving parts and quite a few steps necessary to regulate it in order for it to work properly. Now starting from the key, as the player pushes the key down, it forces the weapon to move upwards, which forces the hammer to rise until this little boot-like part hits the let off button and starts turning, falling off the side of the hammer knuckle and thus no longer pushing at the hammer, allowing it to drop back down and be caught by the back check. Note that the force of the initial push was enough for the hammer to jump the short gap between its maximum rise height and the uh, height of the string in order to fly and hit the string before falling down, this essentially achieving its job of both hitting the string and getting out of the way to let the string ring. And once the key starts to be released, the repetition mechanism here goes into effect. The spring here, along with this lever, keeps the hammer more or less stationary as the back of the key and the weapon itself fall down, this allowing the little boot lever here to reset back under the hammer knuckle, effectively resetting the key mechanism and allowing the player to play the note again without the key fully returning to its starting point. 
Effectively, this allowed the player to play the same note around 10 to 12 times per second and is the action you see in modern grand pianos. With upright pianos also featuring a similar mechanism, though naturally redesigned extensively as it can no longer make use of gravity to reset the hammers. This double escapement action is also what you have in super high-end digital pianos or hybrid pianos, which are essentially a MIDI controller attached to a fully operational acoustic action, with perhaps the strings either dampened for silent operation or simply not part of the package for a fully digital piano. All right, it's time to move on to digital pianos. I'll ignore the non-hammer actions for keyboards such as uh, synthesizers, as honestly, they were never really part of the consideration anyway. They're basically keys with springs under them that work much the same as computer keyboards, just with more than one sensor underneath in order to be able to record velocity. One thing I will, however, mention that applies for all digital pianos is the two methods of measuring keystrokes and velocities. Uh, the first method involves two or more on-off sensors that get triggered one after the other as the key is pressed, with the delay between the triggers marking the passage of time needed for the key to travel between those positions, thus giving you the velocity of the key. The second method involves a continuous sensor, such as a magnetic sensor, that senses the position of the key as a gradient from 1 to 0, and can thus know when the key hit occurs based on the position going beyond a certain calibrated point, and the velocity is calculated from the range of positions that were recorded in the previous couple of milliseconds before the uh, measured hit. Right. Uh, back to piano actions. Uh, this here is a very basic of hammer-weighted actions. Unlike a synth action, there is no longer a spring keeping the key up, and instead the key is counterbalanced by this weighted lever, such that when you press the key, the lever with the weight moves up, and when you release the key, the weight causes the lever to move and raise the key back up. Uh, key heads are registered much the same way as with synthesizers, with a couple sensors per key that get triggered consecutively. As you go up in price, you actually don't change all that much action-wise. The key lever may get longer, thus making it more realistic, as the back of the key can dip further down, similar to a real piano. But in terms of the rest, it's really much more of the same. You have a second lever with a weight attached and some sort of sensor to pick up key presses. Even on the high-end $10,000 digital pianos, the biggest change is the longer key levers and the use of wood as material for the keys instead of plastic. Uh, personally, that just seems like a marketing gimmick, considering that the part of the key that you actually feel is the fake ivory overlay. The biggest change to the feel of the action is actually the addition of this little rubber piece that get flicked as you press the key that simulates what a player would feel on an actual acoustic piano with the repetition escapement triggering. In fact, it's only once we get into the super high-end digital pianos, such as the Kawaii Novus NV10 series, that we see a change. And that's basically just using a full action from an actual acoustic grand piano with MIDI sensors attached and the strings removed, complete with needing to service the action every three years. So personally, I tried all of these actions at a piano shop and found that personally, I prefer the ones in acoustic instruments or at the very least the Novus NV10 line, which as I said, is an acoustic action in a digital body. This means that my design would have to feature the double escapement action of a full grand piano combined with a Yanko keyboard layout with the necessary narrower keys going from around 16 millimeters wide action of a modern grand piano to a 9 millimeter action. So using existing parts wasn't an option and a full custom action was required. Around this time is also when I stumbled across the Hickman action. Uh, basically, I was looking for alternatives and checking out the various actions of upright pianos and the different designs of uh, spinet pianos when I came face to face with a restoration video for a Hickman action piano. Uh, this caught my attention as I was already well versed in the various parts making up the piano action, so these parts, which looked completely different, were interesting. 
So long story short, may I introduce you to the Hickman action. So uh, here's the core of the Hickman action, uh, suitably modified for my own use, of course. Uh, we have the jack, which is separated into the lower and upper halves. The bottom half attaches via this joint here to the key lever, which pushes up on it when the key is pressed, while the top half attaches to the driving lever, which in turn is attached to the hammer lever and the flange, which is uh, bolted to the frame. The two halves of the jack are connected together at this mid joint with the mouth right here uh, set up to allow the mid joints to be over center and thus locked when in its resting state. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, if I was to draw a line from the upper pin here to the lower pin here, you would see that the mid joint will land ever so slightly on the side opposite to the mouth. In such a state, I can press as hard as I can and yet the jack remains stable. If, however, I was to push just a bit from the side, the mid joint will travel across the center line and cause the jack to buckle like so, and thus decoupling the motion of the driving lever above from the key lever below. Uh, the repetition spring here connects the driving lever to the lower jack, pushing it away like so, uh, which is used in two ways. The first being that it pushes up on the driving lever, which uh, when the action is installed in place, uh, causes the hammer to hover in the air during the reset of the repetition, while the key lever drops down and allows the jack to reset within the first 25% uh, or so of the key up motion. And the second being that it pushes the two parts of the jack together uh, into their closed state. But hold on, I hear you say, uh, the two parts of the jack don't look like they're being pushed closed. And in fact, they seem quite open. And you're absolutely right. When taken out of the piano like this, the spring pushes the jack to be just a tad open, aka buckled. However, what you can't forget is that once the action is in place, the key lever will connect to the lower jack at this point, effectively providing a counter force, like so, which, as you can see, causes the repetition spring to force the jack closed. Which is how it'll remain until the driving lever rotates sufficiently to push at the side of the upper jack here and cause it to buckle. Uh, the last thing to mention before we move on to the action seated fully inside the piano is this section of the driving lever here. It is effectively the limiter that stops the rotation of the driving lever at a point where the hammer is just uh, five millimeters away from the string, uh, making the hammer need to fly up the rest of the distance under its own inertia and rotating around this pin to hit the strings before falling back down out of the way of the string. Now, both this limiter and the part above it that buckles the jack have adjustment screws in the full Hickman action, but since this is a digital and not an acoustic piano, and I'm 3D printing all the parts with uh, pretty high tolerances, I figured I could just adjust the action in CAD and uh, print all 88 keys correctly with no need for further adjustment. Well, <laughs> let's move on to the full piano prototype. Uh, so. In the key's resting state, the jack has its uh, mid pin over center, thus being locked and allowing the force of the key to transfer fully through the jack into the driving lever and then into the hammer itself. As I start pushing down on the key, the jack rises, forcing the driving lever to rotate counterclockwise, which in turn pushes the hammer up. At a certain point, the let off mechanism triggers, which essentially means that the driving lever pushes on the side of the upper jack, uh, pushing the mid pin to the other side and thus buckling the jack like so. Almost at the same time, the driving lever reaches its maximum rotation, uh, being limited by this limiter right here. At this point, the key is fully disconnected from the action. Anything that happens from here on out is uh, purely due to the inertia of the hammer and to a smaller degree, the rest of the parts. So with the driving lever having reached its maximum rotation, the inertia of the hammer causes it to fly up, bridging this remaining five millimeter uh, gap between it and the string, or in this case, the hammer head felt. With the sensors placed in this gap, recording the speed it was traveling at and sending a key on signal. 
After the hammer hits the hammer head felt, it bounces back down with sufficient force to push at the driving lever, causing it to rotate clockwise, further buckling the jack until the hammer is caught by the back check. The entire action uh, freezes at this point until the key is released. Uh, when that happens, the repetition spring right here uh, causes the hammer to briefly uh, hover while the jack resets, thus allowing the next note to be played um, basically when the key is not even a quarter of the way up from its resting position. If the key is, uh, continues to be let go, the uh, hammer will simply fall back down and uh, be ready from here. But even without the hammer uh, falling all the way down, if we press on the key right here, we can get the same action going on again almost instantly here. And so let me play you a slow motion clip showing this. Now, you may ask yourself, why hasn't this design become popular and replaced the classical piano action if it's so good? And from what I can understand, it mostly comes down to tradition, bad timing, and not really offering anything special to the player. Tradition-wise, piano manufacturers were well set in the double escapement action, so switching over to the Hickman action would have needed to retrain all the master craftsmen that have been building the pianos for generations, along with all the repairmen and piano tuners. In terms of bad timing, the Hickman action was being worked on around the 1930s, so too close to both the uh, two world wars and the invention of the radio, which started taking over as the piano's position for an everyday person home music system, which led to a drastic decrease in the demand for pianos. Lastly, the Hickman action didn't really offer much from a player's perspective. The biggest selling point was mostly that it was as good as a double escape action while requiring less tuning and maintenance and was easier to build, but that wasn't enough of a leap as, for example, the single to double escapement actions, which boosted key repetition from 4 times per second to 10 to 12 times per second. And having said all that, the Hickman action seemed like the perfect option for me, as it simplified the design and lessened the need for regulation, meaning less work for me, while at the same time offering the fully realistic acoustic action for my DIY digital piano. And while there were definitely some hiccups along the way, and I can't say I didn't regret this decision a couple of times during the design process, at the end of the day, I'm glad I picked it and stuck with it through all the issues as it works perfectly in its little uh, eight key test bed right here. Well, and that's all for now. Thanks for sticking around for this and the last two videos while I covered the background for this little project of mine. The next few videos I'll cover the actual design of the piano along with the prototypes that I made and the issues that popped up along the way. Thanks for watching and catch you guys later.